For part four, we'll discuss box plots and methods for detecting outliers. Um, there's two types of box plots we're going to um, talk about, but let's start off with a standard box plot, or box and whisker plot, as it's often called. So um, it's going to be drawn on a number line. So I just drew a number line, and I'm going to look at the data set we talked about earlier. So uh, first, we're going to calculate what's called the five number summary. And these five numbers are always the five number summary. It's the minimum, the lower quartile, the median, the upper quartile, and the maximum. And we're going to draw um, a line at QL and QU. These are called uh, fences. Um, and then also draw a line at the median. Next, we're going to connect these lines with a box shape. Okay, after that, we're going to draw our whiskers, and these connect our box to the maximum and to the minimum. The maximum was 90, so we can draw a line to that, and the minimum was 30, so we'll draw a line to that. And that's it. That's a box and whisker plot. Um, it's a, just another way to visualize. It's just another way um, to visualize quantitative data. Um, so a histogram is pretty, and honestly, I'd prefer a histogram. But this is just a very simple method for looking at data. Where box and whisker plots are really useful is if you're trying to compare many different data sets at once. Like if I had more than one class, I can compare the different classes, box and whisker plots side by side to compare the medians and compare the ranges. All right, um, moving on. We want to detect outliers, and we can use box plots to do this. Um, we can also use z-scores to do this. Um, Outliers are just very unusual, very large, or very small data values. There's no formal definition for it, but we have methods we can use other than just visually saying, hey, that seems small or that seems large. Okay, so let's talk about modified box plots. To construct a modified box plot, the easiest way is to start off with just a regular box plot. From there, you're going to uh, construct what's called the IQR, or inner quartile range. The inner quartile range is just the differences between your two quartiles, your upper quartile and your lower quartile. Um, so subtract those two numbers, and we get uh, 76 minus 61.5 gives us 14 and a half. Next, we multiply the IQR by 1.5. When we do that, we get 21.75. Okay, I know this seems a little complicated, but just follow me so far. All right, so we're going to take 21.75 and uh, subtract that from the lower boundary there, the uh, 61.5, and um, add it to the 76. So add it and subtract it from the fences. So um, what that's going to construct is what's called the lower fence and the um, sorry, the lower fence, or the lower inner fence and the upper inner fence. The lower inner fence um, is going to be the lower quartile, minus 1.5 IQR, which gives us 39.75. Um, and we can just plot that with like a dotted line to mark it off on the graph. Um, we'll do the upper inner fence in the same way. Just take that 1.5 IQR, but add it to the QU uh, part. And that gives us 97.5, so way up there. Okay, at this point, we're going to chop off um, any whisker that falls beyond that, um, that uh, fence and just draw it to whatever the um, largest or smallest number is, like inside that fence, basically the next number inside the fence. So we're going to raise the fence, and um, raise the whisker rather, and our next uh, smallest number is 56, no, 57, sorry. Okay, um, but that's not quite complete because there still is that 30 on there, and we have to indicate that the 30 is in there. So what we can do is we can just put a little asterisk at that point, and that asterisk represents an outlier. It's an unusual observation because we would expect virtually all observations to fall between the inner fence and the um, be, fall between the two inner fences. There is also something called an outer fence, which means you go an extra one and a half IQRs out. Um, most programs don't actually even include the outer fence, but your book includes it. So again, you can just do plus or minus uh, one and a half IQR to get the next step. 
We can also use z-scores to detect outliers. Um, recall, if your distribution is somewhat mound-shaped and symmetrical, um, you can use the empirical rule, and it states 95% of the data would fall within two standard deviations, and virtually all the data would fall within three. This means that any data value beyond two is considered suspicious, or be called a suspect outlier. And any value beyond three standard deviations, or having a z-score more than three in absolute value, um, is very, very suspicious. Um, we can call that an extreme outlier. So just summarizing our rules here, a suspect outlier would be an absolute value of a z-score between 2 and 3. So for example, 2.5 would be considered a suspect outlier, but so would negative 2.5, because it's still between 2 and 3 in absolute value. An extreme outlier is any, um, is any z-score, remember measuring number of standard deviations, that is above 3 in absolute value. So 4 would be considered an extreme outlier, but so would negative 4. Okay, um, so let's just do a quick example with that. Um, the average of our test data was 69.9, and the standard deviation was 13.9. I just used my calculator to calculate these. So quick question, is a test score of 30 still considered an outlier using this method? Well, all we do is 30 minus 69.9, the average, divided by the standard deviation of 13.9, and we get negative 2.87. Since negative 2.87 is greater than 2, but less than 3, this test score is a suspect outlier by the z-score method as well. So, good question is, why do we care? Well, as we saw, outliers can impact our analysis a lot. We've already seen that it skews the mean substantially. And what we want to do with outliers, we just don't want to cross them off. That's not our goal. But we do want to investigate them because maybe it's part of a different population, that data value, and so we should treat it separately. Or maybe it's just a typo, and honestly, that happens a lot. Very often when I do this kind of analysis and I see an outlier, especially an extreme outlier, it's just because I misplaced the decimal point or I forgot to convert from inches to feet or something like that. So, of course, if that's the case, you want to fix those mistakes. Um, of course, it could be a valid data point, and if that's the case, it may help guide our analysis. Maybe that's, an that's a point that we should investigate, and that might be really what discovering these outliers might be the whole point of your analysis. For example, with the test score example, that score of 30 that we identified as a suspect outlier, we should probably figure out what happened. Maybe the student didn't study, so I could just encourage that student to study more. Or maybe it was something more serious, like they're placed in the wrong class or they misunderstood a major concept. Either way, you can correct this mistake noticing that there's something very fishy going on. Um, similarly, if a student did very, had a very high z-score, like a z-score of three or you know two and a half, so something on the positive side, I can maybe talk to that student and ask them, well, what did you do? And they might give me um, some insight that I can share with the other students so they can do better as well.